Vincent van Gogh, Emily Dickinson, Claude Monet, Edgar Allan Poe, each one a genius who died long before the true brilliance of their work was ever fully appreciated. They never knew the monumental impact their creations would have on the history and culture of Western civilization. But this is not their story. Some artists aren't appreciated in their lifetime not because the world isn't ready for them, but because they're just not very good. This is the story of one such artist. This is the story of the worst poet in history. William Topaz McGonagall was born in March 1825. His parents, Charles and Margaret, were both Irish, and while William would often claim to have been born in Edinburgh, the 1841 census lists his birthplace, somewhat vaguely, as Ireland. Charles was a handloom weaver. His family moved around Scotland throughout William's early life as they looked for work before eventually settling in Dundee in the early 1840s. While they were there, William became a handloom apprentice and picked up some valuable weaving skills. At the same time, he discovered a love of reading, particularly whatever editions of Shakespeare he could get his hands on. Despite the Industrial Revolution, there was still plenty of work for skilled weavers. Everything seemed to be going well for McGonagall when he married a fellow mill worker, Jean King, in 1846. Together, they had five sons and two daughters. Life was, generally speaking, pretty good in the McGonagall household. At work, McGonagall would often entertain slash annoy his colleagues by reciting Shakespeare, and this led to him being given the title role in a local production of Macbeth, or the Scottish play. It was his first appearance on stage and his first chance to show off his flair for the dramatic. During one performance, McGonagall convinced himself that the other actors were jealous of the attention and unbounded applause that he was getting from the audience. Particularly jealous, he believed, was the rival actor playing the role of Macduff. So, for the final act during the fight scene between Macbeth and Macduff, McGonagall took the executive decision to expand his role in the play by simply refusing to die. In his own somewhat breathless words, and when I did fall, the cry was, McGonagall, McGonagall, bring him out, bring him out, until I had to come before the curtain and receive an ovation from the audience. Unfortunately, the comments from the other members of the cast, or the audience for that matter, were not recorded. By the late 1870s, demand for handloom weavers had died down a little bit as machines took over more and more of the work. This was okay though, because McGonagall had something to fall back on, as he humbly recalled in his autobiography. But I may say, Dame Fortune has been very kind to me by endowing me with the genius of poetry. He would go on to describe the feeling he got when seized by a creative impulse during a holiday week in Dundee in 1877. I was seized with a strong desire to write poetry, so strong in fact that in imagination I thought I heard a voice crying in my ears, write, write. Never one to ignore a direct instruction from his brain, McGonagall sat down and wrote his very first poem, an address to the Reverend George Gilfillan, which began with the immortal couplet, All hail to the Rev George Gilfillan of Dundee, he is the greatest preacher I did ever hear or see. Gilfillan was indeed a preacher, and one who occasionally dabbled in poetry but generally received poor reviews for it. A kindred soul in many ways. When he read McGonagall's poem about him, he could barely contain his enthusiasm. He's quoted as saying, Shakespeare never wrote anything like this. A sentence we can all agree with, even if the sentiment may differ. This was all the encouragement that McGonagall needed to launch himself into the world of poetry. The next natural step for him, as he saw it, was to write to Queen Victoria, to ask for an endorsement. Unsurprisingly, he received a reply refusing his request, but politely thanking him for his interest. In a wonderful feat of selective reading, McGonagall interpreted this letter of thanks but no thanks as enthusiastic praise for his work. This interpretation led him to walk around 60 miles through a violent thunderstorm to Balmoral Castle, one of Queen Victoria's residences, 
to give her a totally unasked for live performance of his poetry. Arriving at the gates, he introduced himself as the Queen's Poet, to which the guard replied, You're not the Queen's Poet. Tennyson is the Queen's Poet. An indisputable fact, as Lord Tennyson was the Poet Laureate and McGonagall was the, well, nothing. Despite showing them the letter from the Queen, the letter which specifically refused to give him an endorsement, McGonagall was turned away and walked 60 miles back home. If you thought that this would deter him, you don't know William McGonagall. He wrote more poetry and managed to get published in various newspapers when he wrote about current events. He would often write poems about local disasters, notably the Tay Bridge disaster. McGonagall's poem on this catastrophic train crash includes such lines as Beautiful railway bridge of the Silvery Tay, alas I am very sorry to say that ninety lives have been taken away on the last Sabbath day of 1879, which will be remembered for a very long time. And I must now conclude my lay by telling the world fearlessly without the least dismay that your central girders would not have given way at least many sensible men do say, had they been supported on each side with buttresses, at least many sensible men confesses, for the stronger we our houses do build, the less chance we have of being killed. Stirring stuff. Incredibly, he was just about able to make ends meet through his work, although it was a constant struggle. He would sell handbill versions of his poems on the streets, as well as performing in theatres, halls and public houses. His many poems warning of the dangers of excessive drinking did not always go down well in the pubs. On one occasion, he was pelted with peas following the delivery of a poem about the evils of strong drink. Like many great British artists, he had dreams of breaking America and made a trip to New York in 1887. Going by his writings, he was very taken with the architecture. O mighty city of New York, you are wonderful to behold. Your buildings are magnificent, the truth be it told. They were the only thing that seemed to arrest my eye, because many of them are thirteen stories high. He also remarked on the Brooklyn Bridge, comparing it with his favourite bridge from back home. And as for the Brooklyn Bridge, it's a very great height, and fills the stranger's heart with wonder at first sight, and with all its loftiness I venture to say, it cannot surpass the new railway bridge of the Silvery Tay. Finally, he ventured a comment on the city's drinking culture. And there's also 10,000 rum sellers there. Oh, wonderful to think of, I do declare. To accommodate the people of New York therein, and to encourage them to commit all sorts of sin. And on the Sabbath day you will see many a man going for beer with a big tin can, and seems proud to be seen carrying home the beer to treat his neighbours and his family dear. Then at night numbers of the people dance and sing, making the walls of their houses to ring, with their songs and dancing on Sabbath night, which I witnessed with disgust and fled from the sight. And with regard to New York and the sights I did see, believe me I never saw such sights in Dundee, and the morning I sailed from the city of New York, my heart it felt as light as a cork. While he was clearly impressed by New York, it wasn't home to him. And also, nobody ever there liked his poetry either. He soon returned to Dundee and found some lucrative work at a local circus. In an act that was possibly inspired by his work in pubs, he would perform his poems on stage, and the audience would hurl flowers, eggs, stale bread and vegetables at him. Unfortunately, the events became so rowdy that the city magistrates banned them. Seeing this revenue stream dry up infuriated McGonagall, so he took his revenge the only way he knew how, by writing an angry poem entitled Lines in Protest to the Dundee Magistrates. Fellow citizens of Bonnie Dundee, are you aware how the magistrates have treated me? Nay, do not stare or make a fuss when I tell you they have boycotted me from appearing in Royal Circus, which in my opinion is a great shame and a dishonour to the city's name. That is, perhaps, the only poem in existence written to protest the fact that the city magistrates have stopped rowdy circus-goers from hurling eggs at the poet in question. 
Curiously, McGonagall never seemed to question why he was so routinely pelted with food. In fact, he seemed completely oblivious to any criticism at all. Rather, he seemed to just genuinely love entertaining people and getting a laugh, even if it was at his own expense. And that's the thing, as awful a poet as he was, McGonagall was also a pretty decent and well-liked man among those who knew him. In times of financial trouble, his friends didn't hesitate to support him. In 1890, they helped fund a collection of his works called Poetic Gems, which was popular enough to pay his bills for a few years. Even as strangers were pelting him with the ingredients of a cake, his pals were looking out for him, suggesting that he was a better friend and father than he was a poet. In 1893, he did become frustrated at how he was getting treated in the streets and produced a poem in which he threatened to leave the city. In reaction, one local newspaper quipped that he would probably end up staying for at least another year when he realised that Dundee rhymes with 1893. It was around this time that he received a letter claiming to be from representatives of King Thibor Min of Burma, which said that McGonagall was to be knighted as Topaz McGonagall, Grand Knight of the Holy Order of the White Elephant of Burma. It was an obvious hoax, a 19th century spam email, but that did not stop him from referring to himself as Sir William Topaz McGonagall, Knight of the White Elephant of Burma, for the rest of his life. He eventually moved with his wife to Edinburgh, where he found some minor success as a cult figure. By the turn of the century, he had become too weak and frail to walk the streets selling his poems, and in 1902, he died penniless, buried in an unmarked grave. And that was the end of his story. Except it wasn't, because just as he might have hoped, his poetry outlived him. Even to this day, William Topaz McGonagall is remembered fondly for his work. Perhaps not in the way he intended, sure, but there is a lot of affection for this tenacious poet. He inspired characters created by Spike Milligan and Monty Python. He has a square named after him in his hometown of Dundee, and there is a monument by the River Tay with the inscription, Beautiful Railway Bridge of the Silvery Tay. He wasn't a great poet, technically speaking but he is still being spoken about more than a century after his death. Whatever an artist may want to achieve, there aren't many that create a body of work that lasts so long or has such an impact. As was sometimes said about him, if his poetry was any better, he would be anonymous. <laughs>